From the Library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Hey guys, it's Jeffrey Masters, host of Book Circle Online. Now today, before we start, I gotta tell you, I have been so excited for this month. We have a really exciting lineup of authors. On September 9th, Ben Mesrick's gonna be here. His book, Accidental Billionaires, became the movie The Social Network. That was a good one, right? His new book is called Seven Wonders and is just as good. Also, Caitlin Dowdy is going to be here on the same day. She is a mortician and created The Order of the Good Death. And her book is called Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. Also, Melissa Marr is going to be here on the 16th. And then rounding out the month on September 24th, Gail Shee is going to be here. Her book, Passages, was ranked by the Library of Congress as one of the top 10 most influential books of her time. And her new book is called Daring My Passages about her life. It's a memoir and it's equally as good. And today, I'm so excited to talk to Lois Lowry because like so many of you, The Giver was one of my favorite books while growing up. Hey, Lois, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Now, I want to talk about what's inside the book, obviously, but to start off, I think the cover is so iconic, and I've been so excited to see it's not been, like, redone over time. Uh, I'm I'm going to have to interrupt you to say, remind me which cover we're talking about here. Oh, man, I guess it has been. Um, This is the the picture, the black and white picture of the old man with the beard. Okay, so that's the original cover to The Giver. There have been many since then. Oh, have there. Oh, I see. You know what? My I grabbed my book when I was home a couple months ago, so it's the original. <laughs> <laughs> um, but speaking of, I guess, the original cover with the black and white image, I was yep. shocked to read that you actually took that picture. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I hate the word shocked. Uh, I hope you were impressed to read that. Uh, I'm joking, of course. But <laughs> of course. I used to uh, work as a photographer many years ago. And I had been sent by a magazine to do an article about an elderly man who was a painter. He lived on an island off the coast of Maine. And so I photographed him while I spent a day doing the interview. And years had passed and he had died. But then I wrote the book The Giver, and I still had some of those photographs of him in my files. And and his face had stayed with me. And when I showed the photographs to the publisher, they agreed. And, and uh, so that's why we used it on that uh, the first edition of the book. Wow. And you said he was a painter. Yes. Uh huh. And interestingly, I discovered I had not been in touch with him for some years before his death, but his, uh, his survivors told me that in the last five years of his life, he had gone blind and that he said he could still remember, he could still see colors in his memory. And to me, that seemed kind of connected to what the book was about. Yeah, that's oddly fortuitous. Mm hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Now, and you've written such a wide variety of books from Count the Stars in Denmark during the war to the Anastasia Krupnik series, the Goonie Birds. Do you see a common ground between your works? Oh, gosh. Uh, They certainly cover a span of uh, ages, uh, the age of the audience. The Goonie Bird books are all set in a uh, second grade classroom with kids who are about seven years old. And then many of the books are for adolescents. And they also cover a number of different genres. Uh, Some of the books, like the Anastasia series, which incidentally is to be republished this fall, and the Goonie Bird series are lighthearted, although they they do cover uh, serious themes within that lighthearted facade. And then others fall into historical fiction, um, like Number of the Stars, which you mentioned, and and then uh, the the quartet that begins with the giver is is known as either science fiction or fantasy or a combination of the two. So what runs among all of them? I suppose the thread of of uh, my feeling for humanity and and for people and how important they are to each other and our need to connect with each other. Uh, you know, I think that transcends genres and, and ages, and I think it's the one thing that, that most concerns me. Absolutely. And you mentioned the Giver Quartet. Did you initially set out to make it with, like, the three follow-up books? No, no. I, I originally thought of it as just a single book. And uh, as you may know, uh, it has an em- the, the book has an ambiguous ending. The movie has, has uh, made it slightly less ambiguous. But... 
uh, I discovered after it was published back in 93 that, that I discovered from the mail, which has continued, incidentally, to this day, and that's what, it's, it's uh, over 20 years, uh, that people were troubled by the ending, particularly kids didn't like the ambiguity of the ending, the requirement that they create their own ending to it. And, and I think I also began myself to continue my own wondering, uh, the way a writer wonders, what is this, what is that, and, and wondering about uh, future possibilities, uh, which was the, uh, the book The Giver had been the only book I'd written that had been futuristic, but I began to wonder what if instead of increasing in technology as that community had, so that they had complete control over many things. What if they had lost their technology? And so I wrote the second book, oh, a number of years later, and that addressed my questioning of of a community that had lost its technological advances. Uh, but it also, as I approached the ending of the writing of the book, I realized it could address the questions of the uh, of the audience of the first book because I could insert cleverly insert into the last pages a mention of the boy Jonas and ah. therefore uh, an astute reader would realize that he was alive and well and then I think that led me to eventually uh, want to proceed and, and find him and find that baby and, and write more about them so over the course of 20 or perhaps 18 years I wrote the four books and, and interspersed between each of them was, were a number of other books in, in other other styles. You know, that uh, that really surprises me that people are upset about it because, I mean, I, I read it last week to like reacquaint myself and I was surprised how vague the ending was. It, I don't remember it being vague. Well, uh, I always thought it was an optimistic ending, but I discovered that a lot of people, adults included, assumed that the ending, the description at the ending was uh, uh, a description of death, a metaphor for death, as you, as it were. And so a lot of people were troubled by that and thought that the boy and the baby were dead. I, of course, knew all along that they were alive and well. Of course. Oh, yeah, they're going to like a lit house with music. I thought it was a parent. <laughs> now, you, I thought it was interesting, actually, how little technology like appeared in their day-to-day -day lives. Like beyond the computers or the TV screen and the giver's library. Yeah, yeah. and incidentally, when, when the making of the movie took place, it was 20 years after the publication of the book, and the movie makers wide, wisely realize that now they're dealing with a future 20 years beyond the future that the book had imagined. And so certain things, like the TV screens, uh, are changed into what might be more likely farther into the future. And so instead of the intrusiveness of the, uh, what is her name, the chief elder or, or some authority, uh, peering into your house on TV screen and speaking to you, that person now appears as a hologram. Uh, and in addition, uh, instead of, as in the book, taking the pills each morning, uh, they have a much more futuristic little gizmo by the front door, uh, which, which gives them an injection and, and records that they've received the injection. Uh, so those are, those are minor changes, but I think they're indicative of, of the, the advances in technology that are now happening so fast, it's hard even to imagine what they might be by the time this book would, would be taking place. Right. While you're uh, writing... You, you started to mention that there is very little mention of technology, and that, that's my... I started to say my fault, but but uh, I don't know that there's any blame to be laid. No. It's just not, not my interest. I, I, I have zero interest in technology, and so I, in writing about the future, had to acknowledge that that uh, their lives were controlled by technology, but I felt no reason. I felt did not feel compelled to describe it in any detail. Of course, and I feel like that's actually kept the book relevant. You know, uh -huh. so many books focus on the technology, and then we get to that point, it's become like farcical. You know, there's no flying uh -huh. cars in the giver. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of liked the fact that uh, the world of the giver, the community, which was small, it's portrayed as slightly larger in the film, uh, has has no cars. I tried to think of all the things when I was writing this in 1993, 
all of the things that that were problematic in our lives. And I got rid of the obvious, the racism, crime, uh, poverty, uh, discrimination, all of those things. Uh, but then I thought, hey, why, why do we even have to have cars in this world? So I, I took those out as well. Right. And then at one point did you decide to remove, like, color? Because I remember just being, like, mind-blown as a child because I didn't realize, like, a writer was able to, like, write uh, a world without color. Yeah, uh, it, uh, I, I'm not sure I thought of it at first. And I think I recall that I did have to go back and rewrite the uh, perhaps first third of the book and remove any reference to color oh. once I had perceived that that was missing in their lives. And I think I simply perceived it by, as I was writing along, realizing how it was how difficult it was to write about people who had lost so much. Uh, there was no, for example, art or music or literature in their lives, all of the things that make our lives colorful. And, and I began to perceive it as very bland. And then at some point I thought, aha, it's, it's all gray and black and white. And that's when I went back and, and removed color. I did a stupid thing at first, and that is when I had the boy first see color, I had him see it in a ball that he was tossing back and forth with his friend. And uh, it was an editor uh, at the publishing company who pointed out to me that if they have no awareness of color, why would they have manufactured children's toys, balls, et cetera, uh, using paint or dye? And and so, of course, I, I went back, and, and he sees, eventually in the final book, he sees color only in natural objects, first in apple, later, I think, in flowers and, and uh, grass, but never in anything that's manufactured. That's a really great note. The, uh, the reader, of course, uh, if I did my job correctly, doesn't realize that they're not seeing color until the boy does. But when they made the movie... Uh, it begins in black and white, and the audience watching will on some level perceive I'm seeing this in black and white, although I hope they don't stop and think about that, so that they will then have some element of surprise when the boy begins to see color, and, and the filmmaker then introduces color gradually into the film. Absolutely. And then with like the color and other like small details, how much of that came out of like pre-planning and development beforehand versus like the art of writing i'm not sure what you're asking i'm wondering Rephrase that question. Sure. <laughs> no, absolutely i'm wondering um like the world that they were living in was like so specific be it like the lack of color the lack of music no weather um no geography how much of that was like fizzing around and planned beforehand for, okay yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess I do see what you're asking, and and the answer is that that it wasn't really. Uh, uh, what I planned was I, I set down uh, lists of. Uh, well, uh, first I drew a map of the community and and uh, you know named to myself appropriate buildings that would house you know offices sure. and, and the courtroom and whatever the school the place where the babies were kept another thing that they had incidentally terrific childcare there were a lot of good things about hmm. this community but then as I began to write and move the plot along. Uh, and and realized uh, probably subconsciously at first how much had been lost. Uh, then I, I began to sense the the lack of color and the blandness, and it became difficult to write because I'm accustomed to writing descriptively. I happen to be a very visual writer, perhaps because I was a photographer. And and so I, I'm accustomed to describing things. And I, I realized I was describing things that were boring and dull, although the people living there didn't perceive that. So it was an interesting exercise, but, but it was difficult at the same time. Oh, that's interesting. And I also thought it was interesting that they, like, didn't question authority. They kind of, like, like a devout religion, they just kind of, like, didn't question and ask why we had to do this, and they, like, went along with it. I think it's probably not unlike, not that I have ever belonged to a cult, but it's not unlike growing up in in a rigidly structured cult-like community. Uh, like, for exam example, the Amish. I did grow up in Pennsylvania. Things have been that way for so long. It's the accepted way. It's what they're taught from birth. 
and uh, and and the same as from what little I know about some cults. And incidentally, I did get a letter one time from a man who had grown up, been born into, and grown up in a cult called the Bruderhof, uh, and had left as an adult, and had found such difficulty in adjusting to what we think of as a normal life, that he was seeing a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist had had suggested that he read The Giver. So so there are there those... Uh, Wow. Uh, those comparisons, uh, I think, of that kind of life that that you lead unquestioned and you you assume, if not happiness, contentment. And uh, and that's what I tried to portray in the book. I tried to make it seductive as well. There are enough elements that that are very good uh, about the place uh, that that I tried to make it appealing so that the reader would be a little bit seduced at least. Yeah, I think that came across. Good. And religion as we know it today like doesn't exist in that world. Um, why did you choose to give many of the characters biblical names? You know, I wasn't aware of that. I, I, uh, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it almost seems I've, I've heard so often from people who have uh, made those connections. Uh, but I am not myself a religious person, and I'll, although I, I'm the one who chooses the names, they seem to come to me when I'm writing a book, the names that the characters are, are named. And uh, and they always seem to be the right names, but I did not perceive them as having uh, a biblical context. However, after the first book, and then I went on to write the other three eventually, when I wrote the fourth one, the main character is the young woman who is giving birth on the first page to the baby who turns out to be Gabe in, in the first book. Uh, so she is the birth mother. And when I began to perceive her in my mind, to see her and imagine her the way I do with each book character, she came, as my book characters always do, with a name. And her name, when I began writing, was Mary. And I perceived right away that that was going to cause me problems because people were going to take that as a religious, uh, you know, religiously significant name. And so I changed it. It's very rare that I change a name, but that time I did. I did not, however, uh, perceive those, those names as being of that kind of significance in The Giver. Oh, interesting. I had a grandson born the year I was writing that book who was named Asher, and that's how that name came to be. <laughs> I don't know if that has a biblical uh, reference or not. Well, tell me, what was significant about the age of 12 that Jonas was? Like, um, I forgot how young he was, like reading the yeah, book. Yeah, and in the movie, they've made them older. Um, I, I like writing about that age or thereabouts, 12, 11, 12, 13, simply because it's an age of, of such transitional importance for kids. It's the age at which they're beginning to make decisions for themselves, apart from their parents, and beginning to think at some level about uh, what, what, who are they are going to be as people. And, and those decisions are going to be monumental ones. And, and so, uh, I mean, it's the age, too, and the book is often given as a bar mitzvah gift. It's the age of, of becoming an adult, uh, of, of religious significance in the Jewish faith. Uh, when the movie makers decided to make them older so that they're teenagers, uh, it was for pragmatic reasons. Uh, their market research shows that teenagers, who are a large segment of the movie-going population, won't go to a movie about 12-year-olds. And so uh, in the movie, the kids are teenagers, and I was concerned about that until I saw the way they were portrayed. Because in, in the world of The Giver, in such a restricted world, the kids as teenagers are so innocent, unsophisticated, and naive that they might as well be 12-year-olds. And so it doesn't seem to matter after you adjust in the first 30 seconds of looking at the film, you don't care any longer that they're not 12. Oh, the, wow. same, the same things apply. They're, they're still uh, young. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they have no knowledge of the world. And they're they're worried about what their assignment is going to be, but but now they're sixteen instead of twelve, and it doesn't matter. And speaking of the movie, was it hard to give over the rights of the book, knowing that legally you had very little say in what they would ultimately do with it? 
legal I had no say whatsoever but when I when I sold the rights to the book which was shortly after the book was published it was to Jeff Bridges and to his then partner and still partner in the production Nikki Silver both of whom uh, had read the book and were passionate about the book and were uh, determined to maintain the integrity of the book and and I felt they were they were the best people into whose hands I, I could place it and and they continued to feel that way during the long years when they didn't get the movie made sure uh, they their own kids I mean Jeff's kids who, who were young at the time are now in their 30s he's a grandfather now uh, but they continued to maintain that dedication to the content of the book even though, um, and I knew from the start, that a movie can't be the same as a book, particularly a book like this, which is largely introspective. They would have to, have to add a lot of visual stuff and some action. So I just trusted them to do it, to make the additions they needed to make in keeping with the intention of the book. And I think they did a pretty good job. Sure. Is there any talk of making the follow-up books for the Giver into movies? Uh, oh, there murmur about it, but uh, I don't know that that will happen. For one thing, Jeff sure. was very passionately involved, and of course, as he played the role of the giver, and the giver doesn't appear in the subsequent <laughs> books, so chances are he won't be so passionate about, about sure. subsequent ones. You know, he just uh, now is like the perfect age to play the giver. Was he always going to play that role? No, he was going to uh, direct it, and he was going to cast his father in the role. Oh. His father, as you know, was a very distinguished actor. Uh, and then his father died in, I think, uh, oh, I've forgotten what year. And uh, and the movie hadn't been made, and time passed, time passed. And, and then Jeff realized that he had gotten old enough to play the role, which, of course, he does. Wow. Um, now, I want to phrase this as like politely as possible, but um, I'm curious why you decided to make the main character, Jonas, male. I only ask because writers like generally write from the point of view of their own gender, and his gender seems so like insignificant to the actual story. Yeah, it probably is. Uh, and I've I've written I think I've written forty five books, and uh, they're not equally di- divided with male and female protagonists, but certainly many of them have a male protagonist, and I think it's just kind of almost a random selection on my part. I don't remember which book of mine had preceded The Giver, but chances are it had a female protagonist. And so uh, I'm guessing that it just seemed like time to use a male. Uh, Of the subsequent books, uh, there are four altogether, and two have a male protagonist and two have a female. So it just uh, is almost a random selection. And and in the, uh, you're correct that in the book, it could have been either male or female, and I don't know that it would have mattered very much, with this exception. Uh, the the book is much beloved by young boys, and that's an age at which it's hard to hook a kid on a book, a boy. It's an age when they're starting not to read fiction. I know that from having had two sons and now two grandsons. Um, and uh, and if, it, if the book had had a girl protagonist, I think it would have lost a large part of the audience that it eventually acquired. So even though it was not a conscious choice, I think it was a, a smart one. Totally. And The Giver is like the keeper of memories. In the land of few memories, why was it important for the family to share their dreams every morning with each other? Oh, uh, gosh, you know, it's hard for me to go back and think, uh, you know, try to recreate what, <laughs> what my mind was thinking when I, when I put something into a book. But in a way, it was almost a spoof on, because it was a, a society which was devoid of emotion, it was, it was kind of a, a, a spoof on, on uh, oh, what's the word I want? You know, superficial psychobabble uh, telling their dreams. It also was a way of invading their privacy. Uh, I'm not sure I thought of that at the time, but looking back on it, it seems to me that, it, that it's, a, it's a, a, a clear invasion of privacy to force people to tell their feelings at dinner and, and tell their dreams at breakfast. Oh, it's such like a highly monitored society. It's just one more way. Mm-hmm. You, you're peering into their minds. And theoretically, if 
if somebody is listening in to those tellings of what they're feeling and what they're dreaming, uh, the authorities will know right away if somebody is beginning to harbor any any devious thoughts. It seems to predict like the uh, NSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there are a lot of kind of sinister uh, uh, things of that sort that correlate to our own society. Also, it's such a medicated society. I was reading a couple months ago that we, as Americans, consume 80% of the world's like pain medications. Oh, wasn't that interesting and sad? I thought it was like, yeah. terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just personally will testify that I am the only person I know of at my age, which is 77, who does not take a single pill. I watch my friends if I'm traveling and in a hotel with friends, and I watch them lay their pills out on the breakfast table. Sure. It's a rainbow and I'm, of pills. I'm the, I don't even take vitamins. <laughs> Just for the record. <laughs> okay, well, let the record show. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you mentioned your grandkids. Are they at the age that they've read the book? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I have my oldest grandson is 31, and he read it. I remember going to speak to his seventh grade English class about the book. And that would have been 20, well, let's see, how old would he have been in seventh grade, say 12 or 13? Sure. So I, I'm not quick at math, but that's how, I, the book would have been fairly new then. Uh, my granddaughter, my only granddaughter, uh, is in college. She's, she'll be 21 next month. But she's grown up in Germany, <clears throat> and so she's attended German schools, and she's at a German university. She has read the book, and it is published in German, but I think she first read it in English, in which she's also proficient, uh, because of me. I, I don't think it was required in her school. The younger two boys are now 13 and 16, and it has been required reading in their schools, as it is in most American schools now. Sure. And do you know exactly why it's been, like, challenged and, like, partially some censored at some certain points? Well, I think that has died off. Uh, but for a period of time, it, it was challenged often and occasionally banned. Not, not terribly often banned, but often challenged. And it was because parents found it too dark and troubling for their kids. Uh, of course, since that time, and in recent years, there's been a large number of YA, young adult novels, uh, frequently dystopian, that are filled with the most terrible kinds of violence. So I think there's a lot more to be concerned about now than there was when they were were singling out The Giver, which in comparison to those other uh, newer books seems seems very tame now. Yeah. Oh, that's surprising. Hmm. Well, I'm glad we've like moved past that. That yeah. sounds like... You know, it's interesting to me, though, that uh, the, the Giver has been published in many, many other countries, I think maybe 26 altogether. And the United States is the only country in which it has ever been challenged or objected to. Uh, I don't, it's I'm all not that pain medication. I'm not coming to any conclusions there. I, I, I don't know what that means. It's all that pain medication we're taking. I suppose we're just trying to get rid fuzzy. of everything. We're, we're so... Uh, I think it is true in this country we're so super protective of our children. And uh, and maybe it's a reflection of that. Interesting. And I have to say, um, I, I remembered so much about the book as a kid, but rereading it, I just love the phrase, thank you for your childhood, that they said at kind the ceremony. Kind of sinister now, isn't it? Um, no, I thought it was just like, like their society, very like precise, but just a kind of a beautiful phrase. Ah, oh, uh-huh. Well, in the movie, I think Meryl Streep saying it again and again uh, makes it seem sinister because she is portrayed as a more sinister character than the, the chief elder in the book is. Ah, uh, interesting. And this was so many people's favorite books as a child. Um, what was your favorite book growing up? Well, it's probably one that people now don't remember, and it was published as an adult book because in my day there was no category for young adult books. But it was a book called The Yearling uh, by Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. My mother read it to me, uh, even though it was an adult book, when I was eight years old. And uh, I, I had been a voracious reader, but I'd been reading the usual children's books, which were pretty dull fare in my day. 
Uh, and then Mother began reading this book to me, and it, it just was about real people, and they suffered tragedies and grief and all those things real people suffer. And I had not heard that in a book before, and I was very moved by it. And, and I was moved by the fact that my mother was moved by it. So that's the one that remains in my, uh, in my memory as, as a favorite from my childhood. Wow. And um, are you working on any books right now? Uh, I have been so consumed by the movie doings this summer that I set aside everything I was working on, and I'm just now about to get back to it, but I've been interrupted by a dog who had to have surgery a week ago, and I'm now being a dog nursemaid. Uh, but my plan is to write another book this uh, starting this fall, and I don't know what it's going to be yet. All right, well, I'm going to let you go so you can get to it. Okay. <laughs> this was so much Thank fun. You. Thank it's you, Lois. It was fun talking to you. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Yep. Yeah, bye-bye. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menounos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle. Technology, and so I in writing about the future, had to acknowledge that that uh, their lives were controlled by technology, but I felt no reason, I felt did not feel compelled to describe it in any detail. Of course, and I feel like that's actually kept the book relevant. You know, uh -huh. so many books focus on the technology, and then we get to that point, it's become like farcical. You know, there's no flying oh. cars in The Giver. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of liked uh, the fact that uh, the world of the giver, the community, which was small, it's portrayed as slightly larger in the film, uh, has has no cars. I tried to think of all the things when I was writing this in 1993, all of the things that that were problematic in our lives, and I got rid of the obvious: the racism, crime, uh, poverty, uh, discrimination, all of those things. Uh, but then I thought, hey, why, why do we even have to have cars in this world? So I, I took those out as well. Right. And then at one point, did you decide to remove, like, color? Because I remember just being, like, mind blown as a child because I didn't realize, like, a writer was able to, like, write uh, a world without color. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I'm not sure I thought of it at first. And I think I recall that I did have to go back and rewrite the uh, perhaps first third of the book and remove any reference to color uh -oh. once I had perceived that that was missing in their lives. And I think I simply perceived it by, as I was writing along, realizing how, it was, how difficult it was to write about people who had lost so much. Uh, there was no, for example, art or music or literature in their lives, all of the things that make our lives colorful. And, and I began to perceive it as very bland. And then at some point I thought, aha, it's, it's all gray and black and white. And that's when I went back and, and removed color. I did a stupid thing at first, and that is when I had the boy first see color, I had him see it in a ball that he was tossing back and forth with his friend. And uh, it was an editor uh, at the publishing company who pointed out to me that if they have no awareness of color, why would they have manufactured children? Left him while well, I spent a day doing the interview. And years had passed and he had died. But then I wrote the book The Giver, and I still had some of those photographs of him in my files. And, and his face had stayed with me. And when I showed the photographs to the publisher, they agreed. And, and uh, so that's why we used it on that, uh, the first edition of the book. Wow. And you said he was a painter. Yes. Uh huh. And interestingly, I discovered I had not been in touch with him for some years before his death, but his, uh, his survivors told me that in the last five years of his life, he had gone blind and that he said he could still remember, he could still see colors in his memory. And to me, that seemed kind of connected to what the book was about. Yeah, that's oddly fortuitous. 
Mm-hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Now, and you've written such a wide variety of books from Count the Stars in Denmark during the war to the Anastasia Krupnik series, the Goonie Birds. Do you see a common ground between your works? Oh, gosh. Uh, they certainly cover a span of uh, ages, uh, the age of the audience. The Goonie Bird books are all set now in a uh, second grade classroom with kids who are about seven years old. And then many of the books are for adolescents. And they also cover a number of different genres. Uh, some of the books, like the Anastasia series, which incidentally is to be republished this fall, and the Goonie Bird series are lighthearted, uh, although they, they do cover uh, serious themes within that lighthearted facade. And then others fall into historical fiction, um, like Number of the Stars, which you mentioned. And and then uh, the the quartet that begins with the giver is is known as either science fiction or fantasy or a combination of the two. So what runs among all of them? I suppose the thread of of uh, my feeling for humanity and and for people and how important they are to each other and our need to connect with each other. Uh, you know, I think that transcends genres and, and ages, and I think it's the one thing that, that most concerns me. Absolutely. And you mentioned the Giver Quartet. Did you initially set out to make it with, like, the three follow-up books? No, no. I, I originally thought of it as just a single book. And uh, as you may know, uh, it has an em- the, the book has an ambiguous ending. The movie has, has uh, made it slightly less ambiguous. But... Uh, I discovered after it was published back in 93 that, that I discovered from the mail, which has continued incidentally to this day, and that's what, it's, it's uh, over 20 years, uh, that people were troubled by the ending, particularly kids didn't like the ambiguity of the ending, the requirement that they create their own ending to it. And, and I think I also began myself to continue my own wondering uh, the way a writer wonders, what if this, what if that, and and wondering about uh, future possibilities, uh, which was the, uh, the book The Giver had been the only book I'd written that had been futuristic, but I began to wonder what if instead of increasing in technology as that community had, so that they had complete control over many things, what if they had lost their technology? And so I wrote the second book, oh, a number of years later, and that addressed my questioning of, of a community that had lost its technological advances. Uh, but it also, as I approached the ending of the writing of the book, I realized it could address the questions of the, uh, of the audience of the first book because I could insert, cleverly insert into the last pages a mention of the boy Jonas. And uh. therefore, uh, an astute reader would realize that he was alive and well. And then I think that led me to eventually uh, want to proceed and, and find him and find that baby and, and write more about them. So over the course of 20 or perhaps 18 years, I wrote the four books, and, and interspersed between each of them was, were a number of other books in, in other other styles. You know, that uh, that really surprises me that people are upset about it, because, I mean, I, I read it last week to, like, reacquaint myself, and I was surprised how vague the ending was. It, I don't remember it being vague. Well, uh, I always thought it was an optimistic ending, but I discovered that a lot of people, adults included, assumed that the ending, the description at the ending was uh, uh, a description of death, a metaphor for death, as you, as it were. And so a lot of people were troubled by that and thought that the boy and the baby were dead. I, of course, knew all along that they were alive and well. Of course. Oh, yeah, they're going into like a lit house with music. I thought it was apparent. <laughs> now, you, I thought it was interesting, actually, how little technology like appeared in their day-to-day lives, like beyond the computers or the TV screen in the giver's library. Yeah, yeah. and incidentally, when, when the making of the movie took place, it was 20 years after the publication of the book, and the movie makers wide, wisely realized that now they're dealing with a future 
20 years beyond the future that the book had imagined. And so certain things, like the TV screens, uh, are changed into what might be more likely farther into the future. And so instead of the intrusiveness of the, uh, what is her name, the chief elder or, or some authority, uh, peering into your house on TV screen and speaking to you, that person now appears as a hologram. Uh, and in addition, uh, instead of, as in the book, taking the pills each morning, uh, they have a much more futuristic little gizmo by the front door, uh, which, which gives them an injection and, and records that they've received the injection. Uh, so those are, those are minor changes, but I think they're indicative of, of the, the advances in technology that are now happening so fast, it's hard even to imagine what they might be by the time this book would, would be taking place. Right. While you're uh, writing... You, you started to mention that there is very little mention of technology, and that, that's my... I started to say my fault, but but uh, I don't know that there's any blame to be laid. No. It's just not, not my interest. I, I, I have zero interest in tech. From the Library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Hey guys, it's Jeffrey Masters, host of Book Circle Online. Now today, before we start, I gotta tell you, I have been so excited for this month. We have a really exciting lineup of authors. On September 9th, Ben Mesrick's gonna be here. His book, Accidental Billionaires, became the movie The Social Network. That was a good one, right? His new book is called Seven Wonders and is just as good. Also, Caitlin Dowdy is going to be here on the same day. She is a mortician and created The Order of the Good Death. And her book is called Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. Also, Melissa Marr is going to be here on the 16th. And then rounding out the month on September 24th, Gail Shee is going to be here. Her book, Passages, was ranked by the Library of Congress as one of the top 10 most influential books of her time, and her new book is called Daring, My Passages, about her life. It's a memoir, and it's equally as good. And today, I'm so excited to talk to Lois Lowry, because like so many of you, The Giver was one of my favorite books while growing up. Hey, Lois, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Now, I want to talk about what's inside the book, obviously, but to start off, I think the cover is so iconic, and I've been so excited to see it's not been, like, redone over time. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt you to say, remind me which cover we're talking about oh, here. Oh, man, I guess it has been. Um, this is the, man, the picture, the black and white picture of the old man with the beard. Okay, so that's the original cover to The Giver. There have been many since then. Oh, but, have yeah. there? Oh, I see. You know what? My I grabbed my book when I was home a couple months ago, so it's the original. <laughs> <laughs> um, but speaking of, I guess, the original cover with the black and white image, I was yep. shocked to read that you actually took that picture. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I hate the word shocked. Uh, I hope you were impressed to read that. Uh, I'm joking, of course. But <laughs> of course. I used to uh, work as a photographer many years ago. And I had been sent by a magazine to do an article about an elderly man who was a painter. He lived on an island off the coast of Maine. And so I photographed.